So my friends, I'm so happy to be here today. Are you having a good day? Yes. All right, excellent, excellent. Would you like to play a game? Yes. Okay, here's the rules. If your answer is yes, I want you to clap twice. Try it. Okay, so I'm going to ask the question. If your answer is yes, you're going to? Okay, fantastic. If your answer is no, I want you to be absolutely silent. I want to hear crickets in here. There you go. <laughs> Are you ready to play? Are you ready to play? Okay, thank you. And you can get progressively louder. It helps me out. First question, do you like people? Okay, do you, me too. Do you believe that people have the capacity to change and transform for the better? Do you believe that nonprofit organizations have a role to play in helping people to change and transform for the better? Me too. Do you yourselves actually give money or volunteer your time to help nonprofit organizations help people change for the better? Do you want to see nonprofit organizations succeed in this role? Do you like fundraising? Oh my gosh! <laughs> you all get gold stars. I thought there might be like two of you, but fantastic. I was expecting crickets from you. Because you see, the challenge is that when we are faced with fundraising, sometimes some of us in this room get a little bit choked up. We think that that's the job for someone else, for someone who's a, who's a special fundraiser, someone who's elite, someone who's got that magical, magical touch, and, and they like to do it, but for me, not so much. And what I want to do today is I want to help you with, with some power grading, like Todd talked about earlier today. I want to take that power away from the magical elite people known as fundraisers, and I want to put it in your hands so that we can create a revolution in funding for nonprofit organizations that will change people's lives in Northwest Indiana. Are you with me? Thank you. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to draw you a picture. I'm going to draw you a picture of how nonprofits work. It's an awesome picture, museum quality picture right here. Don't tell Diego. So I'm going to draw you a picture. I'm going to tell you the parts of this process where we go a little bit astray, and I'm going to tell you where we should go in order to uh, be successful and be more comfortable in our role as fundraisers and ambassadors for the nonprofit nonprofits that we love. So here we go. It starts with a donor. This person is just like you and me. This person likes other people. This person believes in change. This person is probably already giving and volunteering their time somewhere in our community. And what we as a nonprofit want from this person is three things. We, we want their money, right? Yeah. <laughs> we want their volunteer time, and we want their talents as well. And when someone gives this, this is a nonprofit, when someone gives this to us, the, their money, their time, their skills, then we turn that into programs and services. These programs and services help people who are sad, sick, and dying become happy, well, and stable. Make sense? Okay, good. So when, we get, when the nonprofit is working and really in its groove, then we get lots of people who are happy, well, and stable, and it creates a revolution. We've created a change in our community, which is awesome, which is what all of us want. All of us here want this transformation. Now, another term for transformation in our nonprofit world is outcome. Anybody heard of that? OK. An outcome is the, is the transformation. And there's an author named August Turak who writes about transformation in a really beautiful way. He says that there are three types of transformation. The first one is a transformation in condition. So I am hungry, and you give me something to eat. You have changed my condition. The second one is a change in circumstance. So I don't have a job. I get some job training. I get some job coaching. And all of a sudden, my circumstance has changed. Understand? Oh, you're great. 
All right, the third kind of transformation is a transformation in being. And this could be something where I have low self-esteem, I go through your program and I have high self-esteem. Um, it's a change in your being, your, your reality, your, your ontological self. So does this model make sense? Okay, good. So here's where nonprofits often get choked up in their fundraising, and it's where, probably where it might be difficult for some of you to do fundraising. Nonprofits are awesome at talking about what they need. We need your money, we need your time, we need your talents. Nonprofits are also awesome about talking about their programs and services. We have so many fantastic things going on in our organization, you're going to want to be a part of it. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you two different examples about where we get choked up when we talk about these two things. Let's talk about Charity A. Charity A is a fantastic organization that serves people with disabilities. And, and I want to tell you about this organization. They've got all kinds of programs and services. They're fantastic. And they really, need, uh, they really need you to participate in this fundraiser. That We really need your contribution. We really need your gift. Because our funding is so dependent on the government. Our funding is tied completely to, to whatever the, the state and federal government is saying. And so it goes up and down. And we never know where, where the rates are going to land. And they're going to change consistently. And just when we get it figured out one time, they change it, and, we, and we, there's no way to plan. There's no way to plan. So we really need your contribution to help even out our cash flow so that we can provide services. That's what it sounds like when Charity A is making a pitch about what they need. Let's contrast this with another way of talking about Charity A by talking about the transformation. I want to introduce you to Richie who's right here, he's the third person here, and his mom, Sue, and his dad, Rick, um, and his two sisters, Teresa and Michelle. Richie is an amazing, amazing man. He's in his 20s, um, but he was born, and he's full of love, full of love. He was born with a genetic condition, and that's given him some challenges in life. It's a condition that causes um, compulsive behavior, it's a condition that causes some intellectual delays, and it's a condition that causes some physical de delays and poor muscle tone as well. So it's been a real challenge for him growing up all through his life with this kind of, um, with this kind of condition. It's also been really a challenge for his family. They love Richie so much, and, but they have also shared that sometimes it's hard because Richie, although he's in his 20s, um, has, uh, his dad shares that he has the intellectual capacity of a third grader. So that's made them very, very dependent as a family. He's dependent on them, and they feel uh, compelled uh, to let him be dependent. So when Richie graduated from school, he found a job working for an organization called Opportunity Enterprises. And he is so proud of his work. He uh, assembled, for a while they had a project where they assembled those doohickeys on the windows. So they have to squeeze in so you can lift up the, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> he was so proud that they were in uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or something that he actually took his whole family over to the window section so that he could show them his work that he had done. It's that sense of pride, that sense of accomplishment um, that we all know. Uh, so, uh, so he had this job. Eventually, about 18 months ago, he, he got his own apartment. He's got an apartment with a couple of roommates, um, and, and gradually, his dependence on his parents and his dependence on his family, uh, you know, he got a little bit more independent. And this is tremendous. He goes down now to uh, Indianapolis and Special Olympics, and, and he, he doesn't call his parents nearly enough. Nearly enough. And so this organization has really helped the whole family become independent. And if you had an opportunity, you here in this room, to support Charity A or to support Opportunity Enterprises, how many of you would choose Charity A? How many of you would choose Opportunity Enterprises? <laughs> Me too. Me too. So let's hear what it sounds like when we're talking about all of the programs and services that we provide. I want to tell you about a great organization that serves 
homeless women and women at risk of homelessness in Gary, Indiana. And it is fantastic. There, they have three streams of service. There's a food pantry that is open to the entire community. There are case managers who work with these women on understanding what their particular needs are and helping them navigate through, whether that's job coaching or resume writing or finding a safe and clean apartment to live in and helps them find all of the different uh, 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 pockets of funding to help them get a down payment and a first month's rent. And this organization also offers support in terms of group counseling and group support to help them over their addictions. So the amazing thing about this second organization, we'll call it Charity B, is that there are more than 2,000 people that go through those doors every month. 2,000 people in Northwest Indiana come through this organization every month. And if we don't have your support, you know, we don't know if we'll be able to provide those kinds of services. Now that pitch, it isn't bad. There definitely shows a need. It's true, but it doesn't connect us with this transformation. So here's what it sounds like when we tell the story a different way. I want to introduce you to Miss D. Ms. D uh, came to an organization in Gary, Indiana called Sojourner Truth House. And she went, um, the premise of her first visit was to help her find uh, a down payment on her apartment. But what she confided to me was that she was really there to, feed, to fund and feed her drug addiction. And it was only through the um, caring and the trust-building process of working with the uh, wonderful, wonderful staff and coworkers at this organization, that she began to admit her addiction uh, and, and start, to start the process of counseling and group support that she needed in order to get back on her feet. Now, I met Ms. D because I was taking a tour of this organization, and she was actually part of the tour group. And when we came back together, she got up because she is part of a group of what they call phenomenal women who have gone through the program and now speak about their experience to anyone in the community. So Ms. D shared that journey that she had with her caseworker, shared about the counseling support that she had. She is now in her own apartment. She is now working. But let me tell you what she said that touched me. Miss D said, despite all of this and, and because of all of this, what I realized I learned was how to love myself. And it was at that moment when I realized that I had so much more in common with Miss D than I thought, that I actually had a lot in common with someone who I thought was so different. I never, never knew that I could have so much in common with someone who was of a different race, with someone who was drug addicted, with someone who was homeless. But it's that change in being that she shared, that learning how to love herself, that's what connected us. And having her go through that transformation and be vulnerable and, and share that with us, that's what made me a believer in this organization. So if you had a choice to give to the organization that has 2,000 people walking through the doors providing amazing services and giving a, a donation to Sojourner Truth House, how many of you would choose, if you had to, that, that uh, charity be? How many, <laughs> couple would? Good. How many would choose Sojourner Truth House? Yeah, me too, me too. So we've gone through this model. We've talked about what it's like to talk about the nonprofit's needs and what the nonprofit does. And we've shown you how to uh, talk about the transformation. And there's one last piece of information that I need to give you in order for you to take the power away from those elite fundraisers and actually do fundraising for the organizations that you love. 
And that, my friends, are the words to say. The words to say, well, first of all, you need to find a friend that you want to talk to, and you need to find a story to share, a story of transformation. And then you need to say these words. Would you consider making a gift to help someone like Richie, or Miss D, or you, or me? Experience this kind of transformation. To go from homeless to in a home, to go from uh, shy and not confident to loving herself, to go from complete dependence to independence. Would you consider making a gift to help someone like this experience this transformation? That's it. Do you feel right now that you can find a friend, that you can tell a story of transformation, and you can ask this question? Do you feel like you can find a friend, <laughs> tell a story, and ask this question? Thank you very, very much. Let's start a revolution. All right. <laughs> Thank you.